Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I want to give a round of applause to uh, Signature Bank and the Barnett Foundation for putting on a great event. My name is Casey Powell. I'm the creator and host of Knicks Fan TV, also host of uh, NBA Radio and Sirius XM. I want to salute these two legends up here on the dais, Clyde and Dr. Barnett. Thank you for bringing us two championships to New York. Still waiting on the third, it's like I envy you as a fan because you've seen these two uh, illustrious championships. It's still a mystery for me, but I'm still I'm still holding out hope. Uh, my question is for, for Clyde. You know, a lot of the times when I speak to the generation who saw these championships, they always talk about the teamwork that you guys exhibited, how together you guys were the cohesiveness of that team on the inside and on the outside. You know, America was going through so much, whether it's you know, the Vietnam War, or the assassination of King, and so many of our leaders, and Kent State, so much turmoil going on in the country. So my question is, what impact did those events have on the locker room, and how were you guys able to keep it together, that you were able to play together and, and win a championship? Uh, I was so blessed to be uh, one of the young guys on the team. I mentioned Barnett was one of my idols, the captain, Willis Reed. His tenacity on the court, the leadership that he provided, Bill Bradley. <clears throat> Bradley's on the board of Barnett's Foundation. He's not here today, but Bradley put a lot of pressure on all of us because when people approached him, man, he would be the first guy to go to Harlem <laughs> to do something for black people, you know, without hesitation. And I'm like, man, this is what I should be doing. But Barnett was always in the forefront with that. A guy named Walt Bellamy, Willis. So they were very cognizant of uh, what was going on. And that's why the Knicks became so popular. Because with all the turmoil in the world, all the excruciating circumstances, for two or three hours, you can watch white guys and black guys playing as a team. Unselfish basketball, hit the open man, defense. You know, and we became, uh, became a hit with the garden crowd because before that, the games were just on cable. You know, they weren't on Friday night mix. I used to hate Friday night mix because that was my party night. And then <laughs> we started playing on Friday night, man. Like, oh, man. <laughs> but the cohesion you mentioned, I mentioned Red Holtzman was the catalyst. Uh, he, he was colorblind. He never saw color. You work hard in practice, you get in the game. Uh, you know, Bill Bradley, David Bush, you know, all these guys. I never met their parents, but I'm sure their parents were like my parents. And I mentioned my grandfather and father who taught me never look down on a man. Their parents did the same thing, unselfish play. We knew that when the team win, everybody win. There's no I in team. You know, so that was never a problem about who took the shots as long as we got it done. Willis Reed was an excellent leader. Everything you heard about the captain was too. Barnett probably owes about $25,000 right now. He's always borrowing money from Willis. <laughs> <laughs> Willis would loan you his car, man, whatever. He was just a big country boy, but uh, always giving 110% on the court, never letting you get down no matter what the circumstance. So you guys all saw the clip about my the Willis Reed game. You know, I, At the time, I was 25 years old. And I thought I was the MVP, so I never held a girl to get Willis because the good times were way more than the bad times. So the captain, if he didn't do what he did, I would not have had that game. And I did not know until recently that he had been in the training room all morning. I think he'd been over at Madison Square Garden like 8 a.m. You know, there was no social media then, so we couldn't call and see what people were doing. So the captain, we just begged him, man, if you could just come out. So I'll never forget Chamberlain, West, and Bailey, three of the greatest players to ever play the game. When Willis came out, they were psyched out. They stopped doing what they were doing. They started staring at Willis. And I go, man, we got these guys. And you guys, you guys so far, Sifferers, the crowd started yelling. 
And then Willis made his first shot. Then he made his second shot. I go, there's nothing wrong with this guy, man. <laughs> but the die was cast. After that, the Lakers were psyched. And, you know, we would go on to win that first championship. But obviously, as you were mentioning, man, it's all about the team. Uh, you know, success. I had great coaches throughout my career. I played 12 years in the NBA. I never had a technical foul call against me. Because growing up, my coaches never allowed me to argue with the refs. So I was never in the habit of that. And, and I remember his coach said, success, Frazier, success, son. There's no elevator to success. <laughs> you got to earn it, man. You got to earn it. So Barnett, like myself, growing up under excruciating circumstances, you always had to give them 110%. Uh, growing up under the oppression of segregation, you know 99 and a half won't do. You got to give 100, man, 110% to get that job. And at that time, there were, was a quota system. Only so many blacks on each team. Maybe two blacks on a team, three blacks on a team, so you had to deal with that. But, you know, I still would not give anything for that experience. And like I said, being one of the younger guys, I had so many positive role models to guide me. And uh, when those scenarios were happening, with Martin Luther King. Willis Reed, you know, we would go to sit-ins, but Willis was one guy who we could not take on sit-ins. If you hit Willis, he's going to hit you back. <laughs> so we would tell, okay, Willis, you don't have to go. You know? But the rest of us, we were always there, cognizant, uh, projecting a positive image, especially for our youth. Thank you. Dr. Dick Barnett and Walt Clyde Frazier. I was there May 8, 1970. I was 13 years old. Grew up a big sports fan because of my father and my love of cinema came from my mother. I was born in the same hospital you were, Clyde. I was born in Great Hospital, Atlanta. And when you old, moved to the, the People's Republic of Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> Brooklyn Public Education, Kindergarten, to John New High School in Coney Island. I went to the event, not event, but when they had the memorial for Kobe Bryant. It was in called the Staples Center. And afterwards, I went up to Jerry West. I said, Jerry, I was there. And when Willis walked out, you, Will Chamberlain, because I saw it. Just like you described it, Clyde. They, they were in the way, they were in the way. Clyde came out, excuse me, Willis came out after teams just started their warm up. And Willis dragged his leg out down the, to this day. That's the loudest. My ears almost split open. I've never heard a noise. I've been to Super Bowls, all types of stuff, World Series. But May 97, never heard a noise like that. And as you said, Clyde, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Bale, Jerry West. The whole team stopped their layup line, like they were frozen. So I went up to Jerry West. <laughs> I said, Jerry, I was there. You, you stopped. No, he said, no, Spike, it wasn't me. That was everybody else. And I said, Jerry, that was you. And then Elgin Bale walked in, the late window. And I didn't want to ask him that because I, already, I knew, I, I saw my eyes. The whole Team, late team stop. And we won that. And another thing, Clyde, I used to go to this club called the West Boondock. And my father played there. Bass, the league. And uh, you signed something. My father came up to you. This is my son Spike going go. I still got it. So I want to thank you for, for doing everything. And then, one last thing, Clyde. Clock. Has any New York Nick point guard ever come up to you all the years you've been on the radio and did any New York Nick point guard say, Clyde, teach me something. I'm listening. Give me a tip. What am I doing wrong? Alan, only Alan Houston and Greg, Greg Anthony. And Greg Anthony. Yeah. 
That's no, God damn 30, shame. 30 something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, if I could ask how the bitch talk in, wait, go, man, I'd be like writing this stuff down. Thank you. <laughs>